God had made a mistake, and he had accidentally killed a boy who wasn't supposed to die right now. A lightning bolt had shot a young man named Toya, who now sat before God himself. God is apologetic, but there's nothing he can fix right away. God makes him an offer. He'll send Toya to another world. This world is filled with magic users and magical creatures, and since God wants to make amends for the mistake he had made by accidentally killing him, God gives him the strength and proficiency in magic so he wouldn't die so easily in the next world. Little did Toya know, the strength and proficiency that God gives him is beyond too powerful. Toya is fascinated and agrees to be reincarnated into that world. He does have one small request. He's a teenager and so he can't part with his cell phone. How else would he make edgy tweets? God gladly agrees. He even makes the phone usable and adds in locations of the world in his map apps. Classic God. Rather than fixing his own shortcomings, he's just gonna go around making superhumans instead. Toya blanks out and wakes up in a serene new world, where buildings are scarce and trees are plentiful. This is the perfect world. He gets a call from God as soon as he wakes up. He had called to see if the phone was working or not and to tell him to enjoy his stay. God had even taken the time to name his contact as God. It doesn't take Toya too long to get to a nearby village, as on his way, a local fashion designer notices his rad costume. The guy had never seen something like this. Clearly, this world didn't have the Kardashians. He offers Toya some clothes and money if he hands over his clothes to the guy. The fashion designer takes Toya to a shop in the town of Reeflet. Despite understanding everyone, Toya doesn't seem to be able to know how to read any of the dialects. He gets his money and a new set of clothes and leaves the shop. After bidding farewell to the designer's shop, Toya wanders around town in search of an inn to stay in. He suddenly notices that two goons are threatening some girls. They have in their hand an ice horn, bought from the girls which they refuse to pay the right amount, one gold coin. Toya then interrupts the goons, he buys the horn, snatches it from the goons, and shatters it right before them. He had hoped this would distract the goons, but they rush to beat him up instead. However, thanks to the enhancements done by God, Toya beats up the goons pretty easily. It's almost as if they hit him in slow motion. After the whole incident peters out, the two girls introduce themselves as twin sisters, El Shihoska and Lindsay Shihoska. Toya introduces himself with his full name and the girls think he's from another country called Ishin and decide to help him out as he's a foreigner. Toya pays them for the horn and the sisters are very thankful. They guide him to the nearby inn where they are staying and well, the next day, the girls take Toya to a guild nearby from where adventurers could take on missions and get paid in return. As they scour for missions on the board, Toya has no idea what he's looking at since he can't read at all. They decide to go form a party and go on a mission as one unit. After the first mission is over, Toya asks one more favor from the girls. He asks them to teach him about magic and also how to read and write. Since Lindsay is proficient in magic, her sister volunteers to help Toya. Lindsay tells him that a person needs to have a certain aptitude to use certain types of magic. To begin with, there were six kinds of elemental magic, water, fire, earth, wind, light, and darkness, and a special form of magic called the null magic. A person must have inbuilt skills in order to use each kind of magic. Toya's not sure if he has any pre-built skills, but he trusts in God, who had told him that he could use any magic he wanted. Lindsay further adds that there will be seven stones of magic that can be used to test aptitudes, and so they do just that. With God's blessing from earlier, Toya turns out to be an absolute champ and has the ability to use all six elements and null magic as well. The girls are shocked as they've never seen or even heard of anyone who could use all six elements. On top of that, the null magic gate that Toya is able to do is very powerful. With this, they can travel from one location to another in a matter of seconds. Toya feels a little bad because he was handed this ability without any practice by God. It almost feels like he was cheating in a game. A few days later, Toya has already learned to master most of the elements and their spells, and so the party takes more advanced missions which gives them more money. They take up one such mission which is to deliver a letter to the royal capital. As the group leaves for the capital, they notice a weirdly dressed woman being bullied by a group of men. She appears to be hungry, and despite being able to beat the group pretty easily, her hunger gets the best of her and she slips. Toya and his group, however, appear just in time to help her out. They run away to a secluded place before the soldiers arrive. The girl introduces herself as Kakone Yae, and she is from the country Ishan, which explains her weird dress. Yae tells them that she had lost all her traveling expenses on her way here, and she was very hungry and lost. 
The group decides to help her and give her a treat at the nearby inn. After having five people's worth of food, Guy finally tells them that she had left home to embark on her swordsmanship as she came from a family of samurais. She was currently traveling to the capital to hone her skills and challenge some people on the way. The twin sisters tell her that they were going to the capital as well, and so all of them decide to go together. On their way to the capital, Lindsay hands Toya a book of all the spells related to null magic. Usually, null magic is personal, and one person can perform only one type of spell, but Toya decides to take on the challenge. He reads all the spells from making someone slip, transfers small objects from one place to another, apports, and even heightens his senses, enhanced sense. Just as Toya uses the spell to make his senses sharper, he realizes that he can smell blood from somewhere around, and the group quickly rush to that place. A gang of lizardmen have managed to overwhelm a handful of soldiers that are escorting someone through that place. From nearby, a mage is chatting spells and summoning more lizardmen to fight. Toya and his group quickly reach there and attack the lizardmen one by one, and even manage to subdue the mage who was casting the summoning spell. Someone was badly hurt with an arrow stuck to his chest, and Toya uses the transfer magic to first remove the arrow piece from the chest, and then uses the heal magic to perfectly heal the man back to how he was before. Toya is OP. The girl in that carriage, Sushi Ortland, turns out to be the daughter of a local duke, and the man hurt was her steward, Lame. They were traveling to the capital and were ambushed by the mage. Having lost many men, Lame then asks for the party to guard them till they reach the capital, upon which they would be rewarded handsomely. Toya and the group agrees and accompanies Sushi and her men back to her home. The Duke, Alfred Ortland, is glad that his daughter is safe and sound and thanks the group with all his heart. He even asks them to stay for lunch. As Toya and the Duke converse while having tea, the Duke reveals that he had sent his daughter to his grandfather to learn a special null magic spell. His wife had been sick and blind for some years now, and if somehow Sushi could learn that spell, she could have saved her mother. However, no magic is personal magic, and not everyone can perform the same spell, so Sushi's journey had been for nothing. It was almost as if Destiny had sent Toya there, and he offers to try his hand at the spell. He places his hand over the Duchess's eye and uses the magic. The Duchess opens her eyes after many years for the first time and is able to see her husband and daughter. The family reunites once again, this time in full health. The Duke is so happy with all the events of the day that he offers the group two astounding gifts, the first of which was 40 platinum counts, which, according to Toya's calculations, were almost 40 million yen and four badges that will allow them to access checkpoints and all the facilities of nobility. With everyone happy, the group finally leave to deliver their letter. Yai, who had previously thought to stay back at the capital, decides that it would be best for her skills to follow the all-powerful Toya around, and so Toya's party had now gotten one more permanent member. After carrying out some shopping in the capital, the group returns to Reflet. Some time has now passed, and with his smartphone's help, Toya has managed to introduce some items from our world into the magical world. He brought desserts like ice cream and cream roll, as well as games like shoji, a type of Japanese chess, to the world. They often visit the Duke and his daughter thanks to Toya's gate ability and spend time together eating cream rolls and playing shoji. One day, the group decides to take a mission from the guild in the capital and take on a mission to search the ancient capital grounds. The royal capital had been changed from there about a thousand years ago, and now it had been haunted by headless knights. With Lindsay and Toya's magic and Yai and Elsie's brute force, they are able to make quick work of the knights. Toya then uses his new null magic spell, called Search, to scout out the area for any treasure and locates one underground nearby. They find themselves heading down a dark dungeon in search of the treasure and find a huge door blocking it. The door has many inscriptions in an ancient language, so Toya takes a few pictures of the inscriptions to study for later. He then activates the door lock, which then reveals a weird-looking spherical object. As soon as the gate fully opens, the object starts transforming into a weird monster with a red glowing Core. The whole dungeon starts to collapse, and the group quickly rushes out using Toya's gate spell. The monster, however, follows them, and the party quickly coordinates their attacks and finishes it off, but for some reason it regenerates its body again. Toya realizes that the core is the main thing that they should destroy, and so with the help of Lindsay and Yai, he manages to separate it from the monster's body, and throws it to Elsie, who smashes it. The monster then returns to its former dead self and crumbles to the ground. 
The party then goes to the Duke to report this unnatural occurrence, and Toya tells him that he'll send him the pictures of the ruins after writing them down. The Duke has no idea about the monster, but he promises his mages will research this. The next day, when Toya returns with the pictures he had promised, he's greeted by the Duke at his gates. He tells him that his brother, the King, had been poisoned and wanted his help. Toya agrees to go with him. On their way, the Duke explains that their nation was about to make an alliance with the neighboring Beastmen nation of Miss Mead. The culprit is probably one of the lords against the alliance. The problem is that the king's only heir is his daughter, Princess Yumina. So if the king dies, the nobles would marry her off to someone they can control, and so they can run the country to the ground. The duke wants Toya to use his recovery spell to remove the poison from the king's body before he passes away. Their carriage reaches the king's gates at a rapid pace, and the two are greeted by a noble called Count Balka. Something about his face just makes you feel like he's the villain. He tells them that the ambassador who would arrive from the Mismead Kingdom is the one who had poisoned the king and was already taken into custody. Toya and the Duke ignore him completely and rush to the king. The king's men are gathered around him and watch in awe as Toya uses recovery, a magic known to be lost ages ago to save the king. After this, Toya visits the dining room where the king drank the poison. He uses his magic to search for poison in the room. Once he's found the solution to the mystery, he calls upon everyone present in the meeting. The king, queen, duke, princess, the soldiers, and even the count are present. Toya pours a drink into one glass and hands it to the commander Leon to check if it's poisoned. The commander drinks it and confirms that the drink has no poison. Then Toya pours the same drink into the king's glass and hands it to Count Balka to drink, who hesitates, and starts crying and wailing about how he would die after taking a sip. It turns out that all the glasses of the king had been poisoned by Balka and his men. Toya had removed the poison from one of them to confirm his suspicions. Count Balka is immediately captured. The king thanks Toya for his help with everything. The princess Yumine in particular takes a liking to Toya and proclaims that she wants to marry him. The king and queen don't even seem to argue. Turns out that the princess had a special ability in her eyes that could see the true nature of a person and their intent. Wouldn't that have been helpful to find the real culprit? Anyways, despite Toya's protest, the king and queen are intent on giving away their daughter to him. She must have been a real pain in the ass. While Toya doesn't agree to marry her yet, he does let her join their party. The king and queen give their blessings and allow Yumine to become an adventurer like Toya. They return to Reflet, and Yumine proudly introduces herself as Toya's wife to the rest of the group, who do seem a little bit disappointed. Yumine was a princess, and the others were skeptical if she could fight, but she proves her worth quickly by showing off her summoning skills. She even teaches Toya how to do it, and Toya summons himself an animal. Since Toya has such advanced skills and magic, he manages to summon the highest beast that he possibly could have summoned, called the White Emperor, and manages to seal a contract with it. He even names it Kohaku, who turns into a cute little cat so that he can follow his master around in public. Their next mission is something that doesn't really make the girls happy. They've been asked to investigate a slime mansion. Slimes, especially green ones, were infamous for melting down clothes upon contact, and so the girls weren't all too excited about the mission. Toya, however, was deviously happy. Immediately upon entering, they find various kinds of slimes that seem to be created by someone for some research purposes. Lindsay finds a notebook giving descriptions about each of the slimes. While on their way up, they stumble upon the infamous green slimes. They try to run away, but slip in the lotion made by the lotion slimes and fall right into the green slimes. Kohaku saves Toya, but the rest of the girls land straight on them and their dresses start dissolving. Toya saves them quickly, but their apparel is still a bit too revealing. They quickly change into shabby clothes and start the investigation. The girls already had plans of destroying the building. Yumine even thought of making her father agree to it, but Toya convinces them to wait until they get to the end of it, and the girls agree, but the end of it is pretty bad. The research that was being done in the castle was one of the most perverted kind. The researcher was trying to make a slime that could replicate the female body. The women of the group see this heinous slime in real life right before their eyes. The castle is left burning along with men's ambition. That night, after such a traumatic experience, the group were resting in their inn when they received a letter. It was from the king, requesting Toya's presence to make him a nobility. Toya wanted to refuse it straight off, but even to refuse, he had to go for a formal meeting and so he's forced to go there regardless. After Toya rejects the offer to become nobility, the king and queen offer him a huge mansion instead. 
Kohaku believes that this was the royal's plans to begin with, as they wouldn't want their daughter to be staying in an inn. Toya and the group visit the new mansion and find it to be as grand as the Duke's palace. Toya says that all of them will be living there. The girls seem all flustered and red in shame. They all seem to have taken a liking to Toya, but were not expressing it since he was bound to Yumine. But this meant that he was kind of professing them to be his wives. Obviously, Toya has no idea of this and continues to say that he loves all of them equally. The girls run away in shame and Yumine goes to confront them. She has no issues sharing Toya with them, but this is getting weird. Hope you enjoyed part one. If this video gets 500 likes, I'll go ahead and make a part two. Thanks for watching.